Compton Electron. I think we deserve by the tech. Everybody ionize. Mm. We're just throwing words at me. Ionize what? Doesn't he get absorbed by the technologist? What is it ionized? It's absorbed the by the atom. Atom. More? I need more detail than that, Amy. What ionize what atom? Which atom? We got trillions of them. The orbital atom. Tissue atom. It goes off and it interacts with other atoms. <laughs> Where are these other atoms, John? In the body, like an atom next to the atom to just my, neighbor, my neighboring atom. My neighboring atom. Because if I possess enough kinetic energy that I am now considered a quantum electron, I have enough energy minus the, the binding energy of where I just collided, right? I'm not traveling to here all the way over here. Make sense? There is just way too many millions of atoms that I am going to pass along the way. It does not happen neighboring atoms adjacent atoms that's what that word means the ones that are close by eventually where will a compton electron settle not going to find its way back to the x-ray the, uh, the x-ray circuit or the electrical circuit where is an a compton electron going to settle yes justly in the outer shell of what? The orbit. The orbit. I understand what an orbital shell is. I understand that. But what? Where? In like on the on the outer shell, the last outer outer shell. Yeah, the same, to the same electron that it just came from, and went to the same atom that it just came from. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. no. It's a different one. To a different one. Which one? The neighboring one, right? Beautiful. Thank you. So when you guys explain it that way, when you say orbit, electron, atom, kinetic, those are fragments of statements. Does that make sense? I only understand a little bit of what you understand. If you say the constant electron, now possesses enough kinetic energy it can continue to ionize neighboring neighboring electrons right neighboring atom electron but once it settles it is going to settle where there is a vacant position on an outer shell of a neighboring atom we know that a filament electron has the possibility to go back to the electrical circuit or settle into a tungsten atom missing an electron has a vacancy, right? It's kind of like a motel. You can't sit there. There's no vacancy. Make sense? There's got to be a vacancy. Because if you don't, now, okay, so then I'll ask one more question. Thank you, Justly. When an atom is removed, when an electron is removed, what charge does the atom take? Go ahead, John. Positive. Positive because it loses one electron. A what? Positive okay. because it loses one electron. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and move on. Great, great, great. We're going to go ahead and move on to photoelectric. But before we get started with that, I wanted to make sure we went back and I showed you an image that we are going to look at fog. Remember I promised you fog, didn't I? So here is a fog image. So when we take a look at fog, we're looking at this. We see, oh wow, there is a blanket, a blanket of gray. Everything else looks like there is gray overlying the anatomy except for right here. Now you can really see this square, right? This square or whatever was used to absorb all of those Compton interactions because fog is a byproduct of Compton scatter. How do we get fog? 
Compton Scatter Interactions? How is fog created? Compton Scatter Interaction. It's a byproduct. Make sense? So when we see fog on an image, is it helpful? Yeah. No, it's not helpful. It actually takes away, it degrades the actual anatomy so we can see that small uh, objects such as lung markings or costophrenics or outlines of the cortical margins of the bones can't really see the clavicle or the shoulder here, but we can see the clavicle clearly here. So scatter or uh, Compton scatter interaction leads to image fog. This is fog. Does anyone have any questions? No? Yeah, I do. So, so is it, so the fog that we're seeing, it's this photon, it's as it's going across the image receptor, is it just like ab absorption that's happening all along it? it is that li little pieces of absorption? Right. Let's just, let's, let's, let's think of it like a, okay, so what it, eventually it's going to be, um, and when we start talking about energy passing through, if you had, okay, so let's just put it into this form, John, John in. if you had a hundred KeV photon, right, and it passed through, let's just say the apex of the left lung here. We know the what kind of material is the left lung apex? What kind of material is it? Describe it for me. What is lung material? What is very, it? radiolucent? It's very radiolucent, meaning it's not going to block anything, is it? Mm -hmm. But let's just say so this 100 keV photon came in. However, in the process of interacting with this soft tissue, this very soft uh, radiolucent tissue, it scattered. So the energy that was remaining as it passed through this radiolucent material ended up over here. Let's just say it over here. It's not indicative of what was remaining energy as it was supposed to land on the image receptor. It got detoured and that energy, what was remaining after going through that part, transferred its energy level somewhere else on a radiograph. When that happens, we're, we're taking away from the outline of x-ray going through a patient. It's almost like saying, I'm gonna throw this balloon art, this balloon filled with blue paint and hit my canvas but in the process it got detoured and moved somewhere else and it just got deposited on another part of the canvas so that color does not reflect what the, the tissue absorbency was it's all going to be about the tissue absorbency why do some x-rays go through uh, tissue easier than bubble? So it's going to be about the tissue absorbency. It'll, it'll start to make more sense as we start to put it all together. Okay? But just think, when this happens, when this happens, when we have radiographic fog, we've had way too many Compton interactions and the deposits of energy no longer become anatomically representative of the energy that landed there. It does not represent the anatomic number of where it um, interacted with. Okay. Okay. Right. okay, so here we are. Any other questions before we move into photoelectric? Uh, I have one question. So, go ahead. so if we choose the wrong body part, are we creating fog or not? Uh, yes, possibly. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Great question. Because yeah, and then sometimes even if we choose the right body part, we're gonna learn that we're gonna need devices to help us. Okay. So remember, we when so let me ask this question: When KVP went up, did Compton interactions go up, Isaias? 
Yes. Okay, so when KVP interact KVP went up, content interactions also go up, right? What I'm going to say about KVP is we have to choose a KVP. We have to choose a KVP. So when you go back into your bond trigger, you'll see that chest are going to be between 100 to 120 KVP and bones like the hand or the foot or the femur are going to be somewhere between 60 and 70. So there is a reason why we want to adjust our KVP. Okay, but we're not there yet as to why. Okay, the KVP, KVP is going to play a big factor for us. Okay, good. All right. Any other questions of Compton before I get started with the photoelectric? All right. So what do I have here? When we're talking about photoelectric, we're talking about, let's take a look at this image because I want to be able to make it clear. I want to be able to make it clear when I say equal or greater energy. What does energy mean, Julian? What does energy mean? What is energy? We've talked about energy over and over and over, but if we had to put it in three little three little letters, what would I put energy to describe? What would I say? We've been spending we've been spending a lot of time on quantum physics here. If I were really to have a unit of measure to describe my energy, what is it? Energy is photon. KV. Yeah, we're talking about the photon. We're talking about just energy. Anyone help her out? Come on. What three little letters am I looking KV, for? KV. KVP. KVP or? KEV. KVP KV. is what? KEV. KVP regulates, regulates our KEV, right? So our energy is in the unit of measures of KEV, kilo electron volts. Got it? Good. So when we look at these two, who knows about wrestling? Who knows about what is about to happen right here? Please explain to us if you know what is about to happen. What is the objective here? Why is there a ring around these individuals? To keep them inside of it. Um, to push them out the ring and whoever gets pushed out, that's the person that gets the point. Okay. Oh, good. All right. Very good. You, I couldn't have said it better myself, Amy. Good job. So there is a ring, and I thought this would be a great example of what we're talking about in the next one. Mm -hmm. Now, if you talk about two individuals, let's look at them and let's just say electrons. Let's picture electrons. One electron or energy, no, not two electrons, I'm sorry. We have energy on one side and we have energy on the other. We're going to have kinetic energy on one side, and we're going to have binding energy on the other. If we look and we say, I need to remove this electron from its binding energy, this photon energy is going to have to be equal or greater to remove it. Would you say that's reasonable to say? Right? Right? So this person, in order to remove them out of the ring, has to bring equal or greater strength to get them removed. Would everyone agree with that? Yes? Perfect. So when we look at this, and we look at this diagram, here we have our symbol, meaning our photon. Here we have our symbols of electrons. Instead of like in Compton interaction, looking at the middle or outer orbital shells, and photoelectric effect, and photoelectric effect, an incident photon that possesses equal or greater energy can dislodge or remove an inner shell electron. And photoelectric absorption or photoelectric effect, a incident photon from the primary beam is coming in. It contains equal or greater energy value to remove an inner shell 
electron. Well, true to its name, why are we calling this justly a photoelectron? I can't hear you. Uh, because it's going to take after its name. So its name? Who's the name? <laughs> the photoelectric. Type of interaction, correct? <laughs> so because this is now considered an inner shell removal, it is now going to be called uh -huh. a photoelectron. Perfect. Interaction. Yeah, and it came from the photoelectric effect or interaction. Does everyone see that? Thank you, Leslie. Does everyone see that? So when Compton electron did not happen in the photoelectric absorption or MENA effect, it happened in the Compton scattering effect. In the photoelectron effect, um, yeah, photoelectron electric effect, we have now a photoelectron. So we know the origins of these electrons, don't we? We know the origins of these electrons. Pam? Pamela, a Compton electron comes from where? I can't, I'm sorry, what was your question? A Compton electron comes from where? Uh, from the Compton scatter uh, interactions. interactions. Which orbits? Uh, the uh, neighbor um, out of shell. Is it going to be the inner, the outer, or the middle? It's going to be the outer, mm -hmm. middle. Uh, Very good. Shell. Thank you. Good job. Perfect. Love it. Awesome. So we now understand that photoelectric interactions, there is an inner shell electron of the tissue atom, right? So we're talking about the human, the human, and removes it from orbit. So here is our incident photon, removes an inner shell, K shell, K shell electron. It must, the incident photon must have equal or greater energy to do it. Okay? Now, let's talk about the incident photon. The incident photon that came in from the primary beam will have, to have dislodged this ejected electron, will have given up it will have given up all of its photon energy to remove an K-shell electron. It will, the incident photon does not continue on. It stopped. It has lost it all of its energy. We will say that it has been absorbed. The incident photon does not continue on to become any other photon. It is released of all of its energy. The energy has now been converted into kinetic energy. And so the incident photon is determined to be absorbed. Now remember, in Compton, in Compton interactions, what happened to the photon, Shibu? In Compton interaction, what happened to the photon? The it, will lose, photon. It, it will lose some energy, but after that, it, uh, it's go move away with remaining energy. Okay, now what do we call that new photon that is now going in a different direction? After the incident photon made contact with an outer or, or middle shell uh, electron, what is the name of that photon now? Traveling in a different direction. Is it a compound scatter? Scatter. scatter? Sorry. It's okay. You had it, Aurora. Go ahead, Shibu. Compton scatter. Uh... It is called a Compton scattered photon, right? Good. It takes up after the name. Make sense? Good. Perfect. Well, here, thank you, Shibu, thank you, Aura. If you here, there is no, no more of this incident photon. We have now, it has now been absorbed in this tissue atom. Got it? So sometimes we will say, or you will hear me say, 
photoelectric absorption because that's exactly what happens. The incident photon has not been scattered, but has been absorbed. Okay, so photoelectric absorption is true to its name. If the incident photon to dislodge an inner shell electron has now lost or given up its energy and has converted its energy into the ejected photoelectron. Now we have a photoelectron emerging away, going away from its original orbit. Make sense? So these are the electrons we're talking about that will eventually continue on with other interactions or once all their energy is completed, will settle into a neighboring atom's outer orbit. Make sense? Okay, so let's talk about, before we get to this and the other interactions, now we have an unstable atom, right? I'm gonna get to that. We have an unstable atom. This is back to the question that Ruth asked earlier. We know that the laws of physics are going to say this unstable atom has to fix itself. Son, what's gonna happen how does this atom fix itself? Uh, can you repeat the question again? How does this atom, now that it's missing an inner shell electron, how is it going to fix itself? Look at the diagram. Uh, the outer shell electron uh -huh. uh, just move inside. Move inside. And what does it have to release when it moves? Energy. Um, release. What does it have to release when it moves down, when it drops down? Energy. Release energy? Release binding energy. Right? It releases mm -hmm. binding energy in the form of a photon. Correct? Yep. So what happens here? Another one, doesn't it? Now this one has to drop down to this one. Correct? Yes? It just keeps the cascading going, doesn't it? Done? Correct? Yes, correct. Okay, so every time an electron goes down to an inner orbital um, uh, and becomes that electron for that shell, Binding energy must be released with every drop down. They are either called characteristic or secondary X rays. Miss Ruth, are we seeing what's happening here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So usually, the, the shell that we uh, fill up the vacancy will be called secondary X ray. Not the electron, the binding energy released. Remember that we talked about. Remember that we talked about the uh, sixty-nine point five. What does that mean, Ruth? Sixty-nine point five. What does that mean to you? That was the uh, the energy of the cache What kind of energy? Binding energy. In yes. order to break it away, you have. Had to have a filament electron traveling at least about 70 keV fast, right? Good. So, same concept. If you're talking about the 69.5, it's holding on pretty hard, right? To release it and for the L to drop down to the K, we knew that it was going to be about a 57 point something keV photon release. Make sense? Same thing here, but the only thing is we just don't know what kind of atom this is. We don't know if it's calcium. We don't know if it's oxygen. We don't know any of that. So the energies are going to fluctuate. Make sense? Okay, so these are called secondary x-rays or characteristic x-rays. So again, back to the photoelectron. The photoelectron takes its name. 
the energy transfer between the incident photon and the inner shell electron has to be either equal or greater. So now the, the, the photoelectron has possession of kinetic energy. Kinetic energy means energy that's on the move, motion. How much energy does it have, John? Jonan? How much energy does it have, this new photoelectron? Uh, it's going to have the difference between the binding energy and the KEV of the photon. Perfect. So if the incident of the photon that came in had a KEV, whatever the binding energy of that K electron was, whatever is remaining or left over is now in possession. The photoelectron possesses it in kinetic form. Make sense? So if it has a high kinetic energy, then it's going to have the ability to do more what? Interactions. Make sense? Good. Perfect. What kind of interactions? Well, it depends on what it hits. If it hits another um, inner shell and it has the ability to remove that um, K shell electron, then more photoelectric. If it does not have the ability or it, it interacts with the middle or outer shell of the neighboring atom, then it's going to be Compton. So it's going to continue to go on and on. Make sense? Until it expends all of it, its kinetic energy and eventually settle into an outer orbital uh, vacant position. Make sense? But it can only be, it can only be uh, uh, at a certain, uh, it can only have a certain amount of, of energy, the photoelectron, right? Because once it gets to a certain, okay, all right. Yeah, but so remember, you can only, you're setting your KVP to its max. Mm. So whatever your KVP is to its max, it's not going to go higher than that. So really, at this point, is what is that photon interacting with? Is it interacting with a high atomic number? Or is it uh, interacting with a low atomic number? In, in order for it to have that, the photoelectric effect, though, it, um, the energy of the photon, it can't be too much higher than the, the binding it energy. Much higher because it, it will just transmit after that. Okay, that's what, okay, gotcha. Okay. All right. So, so what does the tissue, we've talked about it. So we know that a tissue atom with a removed electron, with a re removed inner shell electron is unstable. So what's going to happen again, Luke? What's going to happen in order to create a stability within that own atom? How is it going to fix itself? Cascading. How will it become stable? It's cascading. The electrons are going to move down to fill up like, the vacancy. Okay, great. And that's the one thing that I really want everyone to understand. When this drop down happens, photons, characteristic, secondary, however you want to call them, will emerge okay what is going to happen because these are so low in energy and we know what happens to low energy inside of the human body where does it go naomi where does this low energy eventually contribute to right here <laughs> Absorbed by the body as patient dose. And it adds to patient dose. And so what was our biggest thing that we as radiographers have to do? Do you remember, Naomi? Mm, I guess a few things. Not sure what the biggest is. We could shield, make sure the exposure factors are right, striking that balance. Right? But remember, and I put it right here because like, in, in case anyone ever forgot, what is our biggest purpose? Yes, we shield. Yes, we do all those wonderful things, but Can I help her? It's Please. right here. It's on the, the slide. Okay. The anode heal effect, we take advantage of that. Okay, but what does it say right here? Minimize the harm to the patient. How do we minimize harm to the patient? Yes, yes, yes. We have lots of ways, don't we? Right? Yeah. We yeah. have lots of ways. We have shielding. We have anode heal effect. We have um, a, a time, KDT, lower MA. But here, in this specific unit, Naomi, what 
other ways do we know how to minimize patient dose? By understanding our interactions, by understanding that when we have Compton scatter, we know that we're going to have more patient dose. When we have photoelectric interactions, we know that we're going to have more patient dose. So understanding what we do and how we do it can minimize patient dose while improving image quality. Make sense? So this is the just of why we have to understand these interactions. Thank you. So you don't have this, even though this is in your book. I'm going to give you an opportunity to go ahead and copy this, even though, again, it is in your book. But I like or take a picture, add it to your slides. This is connect the concepts, and I want you to start understanding what factors, what variables affect this type of interaction. As the incident photon of energy, the incident photon energy begins to exceed the inner shell binding energy, meaning that the energy that's coming in on the photon is getting super high. The chances of photoelectric interaction begin to decline. So when there is, when the energy gets to be too big to exceed the level of the K-shell electron, uh, electron binding energy, the interaction starts to go down. The probability of interaction starts to go down. So what happens when this, the interaction probability starts to go down, the chances increase that the tissue is going to be penetrated and transmitted. So no absorption, meaning that the, the energy is going to be penetrated, transmitted. No absorption. Okay? So how does this relevant to what we choose? When the radiographer chooses a KVP range that is too high, too high for the anatomic part of interest, less absorption takes place. But we can't always have too high because it is super, 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 super necessary for absorption to happen. We don't want to have too much patient absorption, but we need to have enough in order to create an image. I'll give you about one more minute to finish copying that and ask anyone have, anyone have any questions about what we just talked about. So it's kind of like a fine line between between creating Compton interactions and photoelectric, but then not getting it too high to where it's just transmitting. So what we're going to learn, it's all going to be about what you are imaging and what interactions you want to cause. Okay. So we have the ability by manipulating our KVP. If we lower our KVP, we'll increase the probability of absorption, the opposite of what this is saying, correct? But it doesn't change. If we increase our KVP, we lower the probability of photoelectric absorption. If we decrease KVP, we increase the probability of photoelectric absorption. So when, when the question is then now, John, and when do we want absorption? When do we want more absorption, more transmission, more Compton? That's what we're trying to regulate. Make sense? Good. Can you, can you have, is this all kind of based on the same thing, like um, how the photon, how, where, where the photon interacts based on luck, you know, the electrons are moving inside these atoms as well too. So, you know, I've got the, my, my photon coming in and my chance it might hit an inner shell or my chance it might hit an outer shell. Right. So yeah. you say, okay. so then, so then you, then you start to say, okay, if I put a high quantity of probability, if I put a high quantity of probability, how do I increase the probability of that quantity? I change. I manipulate the quality. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. If yeah. I increase the quantity, yeah. I know that I'm going to have interactions, but what kind of interactions? Well, I'm now going to manipulate the quality, the energy level. 
Okay. Can you have? Can you have a um? Like, say you have, like, I I know like um like classic coherent. Those are usually the really low ones, ten keV. But can you have you know a thirty keV photon that just happens to miss outer, middle, and yeah. you strike an inner shell, but it's yeah. strong enough. Okay, and that so that would, that would you can have it. all types of interactions, but what you're basically saying is. When you have the two major interactions to cause image formation, all right. you care right. about is image formation. Okay. So if you're going to have the two types of interactions that cause image formation, oh yeah, classical is happening inside the body at all the time on the lower end of the emission spectrum. It's happening, right? It's probably happening. But what you also now have to take into consideration, we're not talking about just tungsten anymore. We're not talking about one solid element on a focal track. We're talking about water, air, bone, soft tissue, fat, muscle. We're talking about now we have another variable that's going to change the interaction probability. Okay, gotcha. Good, perfect. Okay, I, I don't want anyone else that, that that's just a little bit ahead. He's just, he's, he's getting a... A, a grasp on it so I don't want you to get frustrated because we're going to take it little by little but what I want you to understand here is that as the incident photon energy begins to increase go up high go up high well chances are absorption is going to go down that photon is just going to continue to travel on through continue to travel on through okay so all right, so photoelectric absorption contributes. We said we need it. We need it for the image, and I'm going to show you some images before we leave today so that you understand why we need absorption. You probably didn't even realize that you've been doing it all along, but why do we need absorption? So photoelectric absorption contributes to patient dose. We know, we know, but we have to find a balance, right? We need absorption in order to create an image. It is our responsibility to select those technical factors, MA times ADP, that is going to strike the balance between image quality. Remember, we started off on that venture. Image quality is what we're trying to achieve by maintaining a minimum patient dose. Make sense? This is why we're taking the time out to learn this balance. Not about just pushing the button and letting the computer do it for you. You can, at any given point, as the operator, you can take away AEC, you can turn off AEC, and do your own calculations. Got it? Good. Any questions before I move on? Now remember, I can stay, got to let me know when you're coming, but I can stay for this white, I call it whiteboard magic tutorials, where I start to draw on the board, and for some reason it's a phenomenon, it does wonders. So if you are struggling, please, I would say, sacrifice some time to come see me, so that way I can, we can figure out where it is that you are, okay? Yes? Yes, Ms. Lara. Beautiful. Let's take a look at this image. Here we are. Here we are. Let's take a look at this image. I'm going to give you about a minute to look at it. You're going to be seeing lots of things with it because this is the unit that you're currently in now. You're starting this unit, aren't you? Yes? Good. So, I want you to take not only a look at the actual bone, I want you to take a look at what's going on around the bone. And I also want you to take a look of what's going on outside of around the bone, okay? And this is going to go back to a little bit of what we talked about. And we're putting it all together. This is where we're connecting our concept. So, Isbedi, what are we looking at? I see a tibia and fibula right on the foot. I see a cast around the right foot. And then I see the... Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the prosthesis. Yeah, the prosthesis that is like holding the left foot together. Okay. I see multiple fractures. 
you you see like, you put pathology to down you put uh rad pro down you put oh my god we just we're just we're just putting in a whole and pre obviously down good 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 so you see how we're connecting and comprehensively looking and moving forward what projection is this? Not Miss Betty, let me move on to Javier. What projection is this? What does this look like kind of to you? Look over look look this way. Don't look up here. It is off somewhere top up there. Let's look okay. right here. Um, um, where your cursor is uh say like the uh ankle joint. Yeah, but what is it? Lateral or AP? Uh are you there yet? It's gonna be I wanna say Lateral. 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 Good, good. And this is where the fibula and the tibia is superimposed. Good. And then the fibula over here and the tibia are not superimposed. So what I want you to understand is that we're seeing two different things. I want you to look at this and find out what interactions are happening. What interactions are happening? Now, remember, Jalisha, way back when, when I first met you, I said radio opaque object will appear what color on an image? Opaque? Shouldn't they appear black? Radio opaque? Oh no, radio opaque should appear white. Oh, radio opaque items, thank you, Jaleesha, should appear very bright. Now, why is this considered a radio opaque? What is this material? This isn't a metal. And we know that radiographs are going to be absorbed, x-rays, rather, not radiographs, x-rays are going to be in our diagnostic range between 30, 20, 20 to 30 KEV on the lower end, all the way up to about 150 KEV. In that diagnostic range, we are going to see photoelectric absorption. Does everyone see that? Because radio opaque objects such as that have a high atomic number is going to not allow incident photons to pass. So radio opaque objects that have a high atomic number will have photoelectric absorption effect. How do I know it's photoelectric absorption effects? Because this is extremely bright, indicating the x-rays along this, interacting with this object that has a high atomic number were absorbed. Make sense? So it's kind of like I lay down in the sand. Okay, I lay down in the sand. I get up and I walk away. Daniel, how do I know that I was laying on that sand? Give an impression. You will still have some uh, sand on you. Okay, you well, dust up. <laughs> that's good one way. I like it. But if I look back at the sand where I was lying at, what would the sand show? You'll leave an imprint as well. Beautiful. This is an imprint of what the x-rays could not penetrate. It is an outline. The x-rays were, there is zero x-rays that hit this part of the image receptor because the x-rays were absorbed and never left this object. Does that make sense? So we see this because of photoelectric absorption. The x-rays were absorbed in the metal and therefore leaves an imprint, an outline of what was once there that it passed through. I'm going to let you sit in amazement and absorb that. Get it? Absorb. kill myself okay so who did not understand what i just said about photoelectric absorption 
Come on, time to ask these questions. All right, so now I take a look at this. John, what is this that I'm looking at right here? Is it a cast? Why do, what, what do I see here? That's uh, a cast. A cast. It, it depends part okay. of the cast. It, you're right. It looks like a cast. A cast is usually made out of two things, either fiberglass, which is going to be a little bit more radiolucent. This is likely to be a plaster cast, a type of plaster splint, actually. A plaster because plaster is going to have a higher atomic number. And I know which KVP I choose to use for this radiograph. My plaster is going to absorb more x-rays than the bone, right? So we're now able to identify because of the type of interaction our x-rays are having with what is on in its path before it reaches the image receptor will leave an imprint or an outline of that interaction. Make sense? Okay. So, I see black. Jonan, why do I see black on this image? Because they... Uh, photons just transmitted all the way through. So what do I say that's on this image right here? I mean, what is, what, what is it? As I obviously, I opened up my collimator to get both tip bits. What is this? What would I say this is? Radiolucent. Oh, Radiolucent, but what would I say? What kind of element would it be? Air. Air. Perfect. So we know that air is loose. Loose, right? Air is a combination of gases. Uh, uh, atoms, very loose, and so x-rays are not likely going to be absorbed, right? X-rays are likely going to pass no matter what AVP we set. Make sense? Because nothing is there to absorb it. It's just going to allow it to pass, right? So now what other color do we have besides bright, Wani, besides bright, radio opaque, Right and black transmission. Black is going to be no interactions transmission. What other colors do we see, Wani? I see white and black. Okay, so we see white, we see black. What color is this? Bluish. Like it looks like foggy for me. I don't know. It's foggy, but what color would it be? It, like, it looks like here, but it would, what would it be? What other colors do we see when we see radiographs? We see black, we see white. And something and like like bluish. Gray. Uh, like gray. We would see gray. It looks bluish here. I would say that too, but it could be more of a gray color, right? So we see various, various shades of gray. We have black, we have white. white. And, gray. and we have various, various shades of gray. Thank you, Wani. So how do we get all of these various shades of gray? How do I know that that's a joint? How do I know that that is the tibia, right? The tibial plateau. How do I know that this is the fibula where it starts here, approximately? How do I know that there is a fracture right here? There's splinter or comminuted. It's got a whole bunch of it going on. How do I know? Because on where the x-rays were exposed to this 14 by 17, the photons that were entering and exiting these sections of anatomy lost some of their energy before they created an outline or an image. So what we see is we have to have some absorption. We have to have some transmission, and then we have to have some confluence, okay, in order to create an image. And at the end of your chapter, it'll say differential absorption. Differential absorption is we have this high energy of photon, 
but we put objects in its way and this is what came out right because if we had no objects in its way then our whole entire image would look like this make sense questions mm -hmm. nothing still in a mess so while you're thinking about that let's go ahead and capture this this is in your book this is your five of five so we talked about the byproducts of compton we talked about the byproducts of Compton. We also said that Compton interaction will go up if we increase what? KVP. 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 If KVP goes up, we know that we're going to have more Compton interactions. That's just going to be, that's a fact. So the probability of photoelectric interaction, when we look at my star, my star is there, it depends on the following. The energy, how much energy did we load our photons with? So KVP is going to make a difference here, okay? But not like Compton, actually the opposite. So the energy of the incident photon is, we have to know what that is, or whatever we set it to be, one third of it. The atomic number of the tissue, was it, soft tissue? Was it air? Was it bone? It's what is the energy. atomic number? How easily will these x-rays pass through? Make sense? Or hard, difficult. So the atomic number of the tissue with which they interact makes a difference in photoelectric absorption. And the incident of the x-ray photon energy, meaning how many how many um uh how many high energy photons with greater or equal value to the inner shell binding is going to cause photoelectric absorption so that's going to be the 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 um photoelectric interactions the, the energy of the incident photon matters the incident photon matter compared to what the inner shell binding of the k-shell electron for the tissue that it's interacting with and the atomic number of the tissue. So all of this makes sense. If it's calcium, it's gonna have a higher K-shell electron binding energy. If it's water, it's gonna have lower, okay? And we'll talk about these atomic numbers for different areas in the next chapter. So what does this mean? Probability is directly proportional. We're gonna spend some time talking about directly proportional on the next slide to the third power of the atomic number of the absorber. It's in your book. And it talks about a relationship. Anybody understand it enough to explain it? Probability of photoelectric interactions is directly proportional to the third power of the atomic number of the absorber. What that basically means is that the higher, the higher the atomic absorber, the higher the atomic absorber, the more likely, the more probable photoelectric absorption. So I'll put it in layman's terms. The higher the atomic number of the element it passes through, such as calcium, the higher the probability of photoelectric interaction. So the higher the atomic number, the higher the probability. The higher the number, the higher the probability. Okay? And that's just based on to the, um, the third of the value, but that's okay. I'm, I'm just wanting you to get the relationships together. Okay? So here... Back, back to this, this is important. If the energy of the incident photon exceeds, exceeds the binding energy of the K-shell electron of no matter what the absorber is, no matter what the tissue is, what is likely to happen? Um, is less absorption gonna take place? Yes, so if there's less absorption, 
Like, how would I make that sentence? And you're absolutely right. It's going to be less absorption. So more transmission is where I was going because we're going to talk about transmission, absorption, which is the two opposites, right? Didn't we just say, here we have transmission. X-rays did not get scattered. X-rays did not get absorbed, right? They transmitted through and through. X-rays got absorbed. And then the X-rays got scattered. Make sense? And we're going to talk about different parts of this. So thank you, Amy. Good job. All right. Okay. So let's talk about directly proportional and inversely proportional. You're going to hear these words over and over and over. So I'll say directly proportional, inversely proportional. There is one thing, I don't know if you've heard it about me, but I love relationships. I love relationships when it comes to physics and BRE. I love relationships. So let's look, and I'm always about up arrows and down arrows. When we think about directly proportional, proportional, whatever your variable is on one side of the equal sign, on the other side, when variables increase or decrease, they will increase or decrease with each other. Let's take a look. When we have a relationship that is directly proportional, it means that if one thing goes up, the other one also goes up. Okay, can we think of an example that we've learned in this unit where one thing goes up, one variable, what happens? The other variable goes up. KVP and transmission. KVP and transmission. Perfect. Okay. Good. All right. Let's let's do a little bit more with the interactions. Let's stick with the two interactions that we just learned that are within our diagnostic range. So, Amy, I'm not going to let you off. So, if KVP goes up, which interaction goes up? Compton or photoelectric? Compton. Beautiful. Thank you. Perfect. If KVP goes down, right, Compton, we can't change the variable, we have to say, but if, if Compton, if the KVP goes down, Compton interactions also go down. Make sense? All right. Let's use this in MA. I'm going to take y'all back. If MA goes up, what goes up? Anyone? If is it goes up, the what, what is it, Maricela? Sorry, I think Maricela was first, Mr. Jonan. Um, is it the amount of photons in the X-ray beam? What do we call that? Beam. Primary beam. Yeah, it's the primary beam, but with the number of photons inside of the beam is oh, one. Quantity. Here we go. Very good. Good. Good job. Good job. So I can put basically everything that we've covered in these types of symbols, right? Say one increases, what's going to happen to the other, right? If it's directly proportional, it's going to be in the same direction. If MA goes up, beam quantity goes up. If MA goes down, beam quantity goes down. They are directly proportional. Make sense? Good. Inversely proportional is the opposite. They have like the seesaw effect. When the value of one variable increases, the other decreases. Okay? They have an inverse relationship. So, with that being said, let me try this again. When KVP, according to the two interactions, when KVP goes up, which one of the interactions go down? Quantity. Photo Interaction. Interactions. The photoelectric interaction? The photoelectric interaction goes down. So with KVP, we have a direct proportion relationship with KVP and Compton. We have an inversely proportional relationship with KVP and photoelectric absorption. Questions? I see some of you are like, man, she just keeps piling it on with these words. I, I 
understand. I understand. I do. But Can you explain why, um, uh, it, like, the reason for that is? I think I, I get the concept. I just don't, I can't quite connect it. I, you know, I, and, and in your book, it talks about, like, um, which 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 one? Compton or or, or photoelectric? Which I mean, they're both they're both. I mean, they're very both related because you turn up KVP and uh, one goes up. It was Compton goes up when you turn up KVP. Yeah. And you turn up KVP, uh, character characteristic goes down, right? There is no char characteristic is a byproduct. So characteristic, I want you to keep characteristic interaction. Sorry, uh, photo, photo, uh, photo electric absorption. Electric. Yes. Yeah, that one and goes down. Why, and the reason why, John, it says in the, in, in, in the material that when, KV, when you add more velocity to a photon, when you add more energy, that's what we're talking about, energy, to a photon, it, whether the binding energy of the K shell is high or low, if the energy of that incident photon exceeds it, Chances are it won't even collide with it. It is going to continue on. So in retrospect, when you're looking at it in theory, is saying if the photon keeps traveling and never gets absorbed, then you don't have photoelectric absorption. If the photon is so high energy that it continues to make its way to the image receptor, then you don't have photoelectric absorption. But if the energy is just enough, that it collides and it stops and it ceases to exist or transfers all of its incident photon energy, then you have absorption. You cannot have transmission and absorption. Those two properties are inversely related. So transmission means energy reaching the image receptor, right? With a little bit of loss, no loss, little bit of loss. Absorption means total loss. No x-rays reach the image receptor in that section. So when you look at inversely proportional, higher energy, more transmission. Higher energy, lower absorption. So transmission goes up, absorption goes down. So they are they're basically the, the opposites of each other. You cannot have transmission and absorption in one photon. It's either going to make it to the image receptor or it's not. Okay. Yes, John. -in. I can see your face, John. -in. Well, I mean, just kind of going with what John was saying as well, too. Like, it, it seems like, I mean, like, like, I understand like the broad concept of it, but then if you look at it more like finite, like, like I could say like my KVP, if I started with the KVP so low that all I was able to create were Compton interactions, then I raise my KVP. I have to raise my KVP for it too. Compton interactions. If you if you decrease your KVP to low, huh. you're not creating more Compton interactions. If your KVP, if your incident photons didn't have enough um in the first place, mm -hmm. what would make you think that there would be enough both a photon energy left over after it collided with an outer or middle shell electron? It's all about how much and how much energy the photons initially started with. So if it's too low, you're going to lose your energy once it collides. Does that make sense? That does make the sense. The higher yeah. the energy, the higher the energy, you have so the incident photon comes in high energy. And if it does not, then let's just say it interacts with um and, and then it I think what we're missing is, can a high energy photon cause a, an ejection of an inner shell electron and still continue on? I think the probability of that is still high. We just don't reference it. Does that make sense? Because if the incident photon collides with any electron and it still has enough energy to continue on, it's still going to continue on, still in another direction. We're just claiming Compton. So I don't want you to look at it as finite to say, oh, well, does photoelectric absorption, can that happen? 
if the incident photon has enough energy to eject a K-shell electron and still go on, well, then the incident photon was never absorbed. Right. So it cannot happen. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. Photoelectric absorption and still have a photon continue to move on. So I don't want to get it caught into, are the probability to do incident photons, can they hit a K-shell electron and still continue on? Yeah, but we don't concentrate on that. We just concentrate that if it's a middle shell, an outer shell, there's still enough juice or enough energy in that photon to continue on and, and, and create part of the image. So I think what we need to say is finite is when you have photoelectric absorption, you do not have any more instant photon in that mix, period. Right. So just leave everything else in the gray area gray to Compton, because that's what's going to happen. That's where most of our image soft tissue detail is going to come from our Compton interaction. Okay, I mean, I guess I, I, hope, oh this God, I, just... I hope this helps. I don't want you to get caught into the, oh, well, it depends on the incident photon. If I have 150 kVp set, could it still eject an inner shell electron from an atom? Yeah, and keep going? Absolutely. But we don't have an interaction called that. It's not going to be considered photoelectric absorption because the incident photon continues to grow. Right. It's probably going to get lumped in with Compton scatter because no matter what happens when you have a photon collide with solid matter, it is going to change direction. Okay, yeah, that, that all makes sense. Like I was just thinking, like, like if I if, if my KDP was had gotten you know gotten high. Uh, that means your photoelectrics they're going to go down because you're having more transmission. Correct. Um, but that would also, I mean, wouldn't that also necessarily say like your Compton would go down as well too if you got to that level? Because it's not since we can't have any ejections, it's not going to eject any electrons and just transmit through. No, actually, no, because no. you're going to have collisions no matter what. You're going to have collisions. The only way that you can have complete transmission if you block nothing. Mm -hmm. But you're going to block something. It, it's almost to say, why do you have a KVP range from a, from 20 to 150 or 30 to 150? Why are we using that? What's the purpose of that range? So that we can create absorption. So that we have absorption. That we have Compton scatter. And that mm -hmm. we have transmission. If not, uh, it would be in 300 keV range, and we wouldn't even be talking about this. We wouldn't even be talking about Compton. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got you. Okay, or photoelectric absorption, for that matter. Okay, so trying. I understand what y'all want to get because I want it to make sense too. But I think if we have a high enough incident photon to eject a K shell electron, and that photon still possesses energy. It did not get absorbed, period. It did not get absorbed. It is still going to possibly emerge either from the patient as fog, from the patient as patient dose, or to the occupational worker. Either way, it becomes a Compton byproduct, even though it may have possibly gotten an inner shell electron. But in photoelectric absorption, I want you to know the incident photon does not become a photoelectric photon, there is no such thing. Got it? It is photoelectric absorption. It's absorbed. It's gone. It's finito. It's bye bye. Okay? It's transferred. Okay. So before we were not in Compton, we were not putting any emphasis in atomic number. Whether the atomic number was high, whether the atomic number was low. We had no emphasis in Compton interaction. We just cared about the energy of the incident photon. Okay? So the energy of the incident photon made a difference in Compton, and it also makes a difference in photoelectric. The, 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 the variations, the energy in, in Compton needed to go higher. The energy in pho, uh, photoelectric needs to go lower. Okay? So I want you... To pay, I want you to look at, let me see if I can get over here. I want to take a look at your Bush, uh, Bontrager. 
and this is important. I want you to go back to your bond trigger. I want you to look at your bond trigger. I want you to start paying attention. So let me see if I can't show you real quick. Uh, and I'm almost done. I know that you guys are probably wanting to go. If you need to go use the restroom, go ahead. That's fine. I just want to be able to show you. Here we have a chest. When we start talking about a chest, God. when we're looking at the technical factors, we're talking about technical factors. There's my boxes. I'm getting there. Hold on. Okay, hold on. Let's just go and run it in there yet. Okay, so we're looking at our technical factors. What does it say for technical factors? What does it say? We have 72 inches, right? We have 30, 14 by 17. But what does it say right here? 110 to 125 kV. What kind of interactions, either photoelectric or Compton, is this going to raise? Anyone? This is at the higher end. Of the spectrum. Compton interactions. Very good, Daniel. Good job. So now we just did 110 and 120. So now I want to look at, let's go to the chapter that you're in now. You're in lower limb, aren't you? Right? Lower limb. Ms. Zara, okay. why was that um, Compton? I'm sorry. Why was it Compton? Because KVP was high at the higher end of our spectrum. Okay, so let's right here, Esbedi. Let's take a look at this. What does this range tell us? We're at 60. For the KVP is at the, our lower end of our spectrum? Yes. So which interaction is going high? If, if KVP decreases, like we just saw 110 at 120, what, uh, what interaction is going to increase here? What's going to happen? Photoelectric. Photoelectric. Why do we want photoelectric? Because we want to see more absorption of the bone. We want to outline the bone. Make sense? If we were looking for lung markings, or let's even go here, let's go to abdomen. This is where you need to start paying attention to your um, criteria. So when we look at our abdomen, it's not gonna be as low um, as our bones, but it's not going to be as high either. So when we're taking a look, 70 to 80 or 80 to 85 we're somewhere in between right we're somewhere in between we're in right dab in the middle of our, our diagnostic range aren't we right in the middle so what's going to happen when we start to take a look look at all of this is this more gray is this more transmission is this more absorption what is it if i had to say here is this more transmission? Is this more absorption? Or is this more Compton? Scatter. Compton. Compton. It's more Compton. It is more Compton. Make sense? Because transmission is black. Absorption is white. Our ribs are made of higher atomic numbers. So therefore, more photoelectric absorption is going to happen there. Make sense? But photoelectric absorption really didn't happen here because liver, uh, I'm just going to say the atomic number of liver, is not as high as bone. So this is where you start to see uh, an, a, a, the viewing of tissues by the way that the Compton interactions have started interacting with the body. This is going to start becoming more clear, but what I want you to understand is that when the x-rays passed through this object, they had to try, they had to work harder to get to the image receptor, right? They had to work less to get to the image receptor. More energy was deposited. Less energy was deposited. Even less 
energy was deposited. So does everyone understand where I'm going with this? These are outlines of what the x-rays had to pass through in order to make an image. Kind of like the image of the sand. If you lay down in the sand and make us or make a snow angel, you know that you made a snow angel and someone was there because it's an outline of what was there. Questions? I know that I blow your mind today, but I would want you to think that it is a um I don't want you to think that it is something that is uh Outside of your reach, it is basically an imprint of what the x-rays deposit. It's a level, what's up, whatever energy is left over from the x-ray beam and the remnant beam is what gets deposited onto the image receptor, indicating what was there before. Y'all are ready for the weekend. I know you are. I know you are. My head hurts. Questions? I just want this to okay, stop. read, read. After Halloween is over and you're amped up with all that KVP sugar, okay, I want you to read, 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 so that way you're ready to move on to photoelectric, I mean, um, but, uh, pair production and photo disintegration, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because we don't really see that. We will see that it, it does happen in radiation therapy and it does happen in nuclear medicine, okay? So we will kind of breeze through it. I'm going to allow you to do more of that reading. I want to be able to um, focus on differential absorption because that is what we do, differential absorption. Those are our radiographs. Any questions? All right. If you need tutoring, you know where I am. <laughs> Bye, guys. Any questions? Any questions? It's going to get better, I promise. It's going to get better. It's like you want to go back to the x-ray tube now. I get it. I get it. It happens all the time. Yes, it Bye, guys.